everybody. Um, my name is Felipe. I'm a lead developer on Kerbal Space Program, also known on the community as Harvester. And joining me today is Mike Keelan over there. He's uh, our game and tools developer. And uh, we're going to talk about KSP today. And uh, if you just got here and have no idea what this talk is about, Kerbal Space Program is a game about running your own space program. So you get to build spacecraft in a construction facility by assembling parts together and later launch your uh, proud space herring vehicle into space. And uh, one of the big things about the Kerbal Space Program is that failure is part of the fun and there's quite a lot of failure along the way. But uh, once you manage to get up there, you get accurate orbital mechanics and an entire solar system to explore. So you get to land on other planets and moons, plant your flag, walk around the surface, build space stations, and construct spaceship by docking vessels together in orbit. And ultimately, you're managing your entire space program in career mode, which is uh, what we're developing at the moment. Because Kerbal Space Program is still very much in development. Um, we've been following this iterative development method. So we, do, we started out doing three-week development cycles. And every three weeks, we put out a new version, which uh, was supposed to be stable. So our focus is always on, at the end of each release cycle, we end up with something that's playable, even though it might not be complete. It's uh, stable enough and it represents the concept as, as well as it possibly can. So on that screenshot, you see KSP version 0 0.3. We had uh, placeholder parts, placeholder UI, placeholder terrain, placeholder just about everything. And um, from that version towards the next was when we started actually going full scale with it. Because up until here, we were testing out basic mechanics and everything. And on KSP version 0.4 was when we started actually tackling the problem of doing terrain on a massive scale. And we quickly ran into floating point issues. Because uh, I don't know if you've ever tried, but if, if you just move an object in the scene very, very far away, you start getting all sorts of crazy effects. And um, that's because you really require very large numbers to do um, a space simulation. And a 32-bit flow can only hold so much. So if you've got a relatively small number, you get all the rest for your um, decimal places. And it's accurate enough. But if your value start getting, starts getting like really, really high, then you need to start losing digits on the right-hand side of the decimal point, which means the higher you go, the more precision you lose, and eventually uh, things start to break down. So how far can we go with 32-bit floats? Um, just launching a ship from the scene origin, say the launch pad is at the origin, at about 20 kilometers out, you can see some jittering already. Um, this is from version 0 0.3. Uh, you can see it's already slightly jiggling. At 100 kilometers out, it's very visible. Uh, I wasn't doing anything. This is pure jitter. And if you go much further out, things start getting like really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to do something about that because really, there's still a long way to go here. <laughs> so um, the, the solution for this is actually um, well known in the year 3000. Um, basically, you don't move the ship. You move the universe around it. And this is called floating origin. So basically, how it works is we set a threshold which in our case is six kilometers. And if we move it, the ship past the threshold, we grab everything. Um, the ship uh, meshes, scenery, particles, and move it back so that the ship is back at the origin. So 
what this lets us do is that we can't really work around having to use 32-bit floats. So the physics uh, are 32-bit. Uh, transfer matrices are 32-bit. So it's not really about precision. It's about resolution. So if we can stay near the origin, we've got enough spatial resolution to have a decently accurate simulation. So the idea is that we're always near the scene origin, and everything around us can be built or rendered with nice enough precision. Um, and stuff that's far away will still jitter, but it's far away, so uh, it doesn't really matter as much. Um, but we still do need a way to hold that data in high precision, and for that we do need to use 64-bit doubles. So what we did is we created clones of vectors and quaternions called Vector 3D and Quaternion D, which do exactly what Vector 3 and Quaternion do, but with double precision values inside. They even have the same uh, methods and everything, so we can do everything we did with the uh, Unity data types in double precision. So all our orbit maths and uh, such calculations are done in double precision, and we store those in our controllers for celestial bodies and orbits and stuff, and then we assign them to transform position continuously. So as you approach an object, you, this object is actually approaching you, and it's approaching the higher resolution space around you. So this is how we managed to keep uh, floating point and precision um, relatively under control, but it's really an ongoing battle with it because we found uh, floating point issues just about anywhere. Um, one of the most famous cases, of course, is the space kraken, which is not because we're just going very far, we're getting there very, very fast. So the thing with the space kraken, it's that Floating point imprecision also affects your velocity because velocity is also a 32-bit vector. So, and because our ship are, is not really just a single object, it's made of several multiple connected rigid bodies, um, each one of them has its own velocity and it, each one is getting truncated in its own different way. So the symptoms of being attacked by the Kraken include phantom forces that steer you off course. And this is the first manifestation. As you go faster, you completely lose control, and eventually uh, things start coming <laughs> apart. So the solution for that is Kraken's Bane. Yes. We did defeat the Kraken eventually. And uh, it's basically the same thing as floating origin, but for velocity. So what we did here was to create this uh, reference frame, which absorbs the velocity of the vessel. So that means we set a threshold for a maximum velocity you can have like physically, and after you exceed the threshold, we zero out the velocity of the vessel, and we update that, uh, and we pass that along to the uh, reference frame. So instead of the ship moving very fast, we have this reference frame which holds a double precision velocity value which moves everything else the other way around. So that way, and we constantly keep that updated. So uh, as forces act on the vessel, like gravity and your velocity changes, we're also always zeroing it out and um, applying it to this uh, moving velocity frame. So when you slow back down, whatever velocity still remains on the frame, we apply it back to the vessel and it, uh, it resumes normal physics. So, that leads us to the setup of the universe and how we put it all together. So the big thing with KSP and how it's set up is that we've got subscenes. And uh, subscenes are basically um, scenes within a scene uh, on different layers. So each scene is rendered by its own set of cameras. So they all exist in the same space, but they're rendered differently and they all can have their own reference frames. So in KSP, we have three of those. We have local space, um, scaled space, and internal space. And uh, local space is our one-to-one -one scale main game environment, where you have your scenery and all of the ship's parts. Uh, they all live in local space. And uh, this is actually uh, the scene orientation. 
Um, the Kerbal Space Center is actually sideways because it sits at the equator of Kerbin. So world space is a generally meaningless term to us now. <laughs> and uh, scaled space is our, um, when, you, when you're sitting at the launch pad and you look up at the moon, what you're seeing is actually the scaled space version of the moon, which is a one to 6,000 scale miniature of the solar system which we use because it's much easier to manage these things um, on a much smaller scale. So for instance, Kerbin is only 100 meters on, on scale space. So that gives us a much more usable um, area to work in and, and, to, and do stuff like rendering the atmosphere and rendering orbit splines and things like that. And uh, scale space also doubles as our map view, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. The third one is the internal space. Internal space is where we do our internal views, which are used both for uh, the inside cockpit view and the crew portraits you see on the bottom right of the screen. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so with internal space, we, when you're looking at it from the inside, we render only the, the, the internal space that contains the Kerbal you're currently possessing and we remove his head as well, so you can look around and the head mesh doesn't get in the way. And as you switch views, we switch internal meshes and we remove heads as necessary. <laughs> and in the end, we put it all together like this. Um, what you see on the back, uh, the furthest layer gets drawn first and that's the scale space rendering, which holds the, uh, uh, the galaxy skybox, the, the atmosphere, and then the two metal ones are our local space. We actually had to divide it because uh, even though we have the local space, scale space thing going on, um, the scenery is still too large to be rendered by a single camera. So we have a lot of Z fighting issues and the way we worked around that was to have a near camera which renders everything from very close up to about 500 units away and then we have the far camera, which renders from there on until it all fades away and then you get scale space. So, and on top of that, we draw the UI. Or when you're in internal view, we draw the internal camera and what it renders. So it all renders on top of each other and it composes into a, a single image. So next up are the orbital mechanics themselves. Um, basically, we had to make a big decision here of uh, how we were gonna simulate orbits. And we ran into several issues with physics and physics, and physics integration. Basically, problems are, um, physics are integration based and uh, integration means that you compute the state of an object based on its current state plus all forces acting on it. So you figure out its velocity, you figure out the time step, and you move it forward. But the problem with that is that the state of the object depends on the previous state. So errors tend to accumulate. So what happens, for instance, if you're simulating an object orbiting a moon out in Jupiter? So that object way out there on, in the boondocks of floating point inaccuracy is trying to do what it does, but it's so inaccurate that it's probably gonna fall out of the sky. Um, not to mention the moon itself being flung out and s general mayhem like that. So, and apart from that, you have issues with time warp because you either speed up time and you drop frames and you lose accuracy, or you simulate sub-steps and you completely kill your computer trying to do 100,000 times warp factor. So, um, not very viable for us. So this is why deterministic physics are cool. So instead of the, um, computing your, um, your rigid bodies through integration, we run a two-body solver, which is basically using um, another um, set of values and another set of uh, maths to calculate the problem. So the state of the object becomes a function of time. You can figure out where something is gonna be just by passing it a time value, which means you get to do stuff like scrub time. And time work becomes really very simple because all we need to do is multiply the ongoing clock 
Um, and with the single universal time value, we can resume the state of the entire system. So we don't need to save where everything is out in orbit. We just save one universal time value and the whole solar system adapts to it. So it's all persistent and very uh, reliable. And there's no compromise in accuracy whatsoever because all you need is that one time value. And uh, it's fun as well because these textbook type physics are very much what you find in a physics textbook. So when you're trying to teach about physics and stuff like that, usually it's, well, look at how it went, but it's not really like this because you have to account for air drag, you have to account for gravity not being uniform and all that sort of stuff. In KSP, we decided to do away with all that. And really what you see is what you get because perturbations in practice just tend to look like noise. I can just imagine people coming to the forums complaining like, hey, my space station dropped out of the sky and I have no idea why. And we say, well, that's not a bug, it's a feature. Well, it's kind of hard to explain the thousand time around. So it's nice that we, don't, we have no difference between the actual um, trajectory and the predictive one because it's all using the same maths. So the big trade-off though is that there can only be one gravity source at a time. So that becomes a bit of a thing that we have to work around. And we do that by using the concept of spheres of influence. So we do multiple gravity sources, one at a time. So basically we figure out what the dominant celestial body is based on where you are and if you're inside its sphere of influence. And we calculate your orbital parameters as you transition. So that's how we do being able to go around and uh, wrap around the moon and stuff like that. Um, so these are your orbital parameters. We use them in two ways. We calculate them from position and velocity for vessels. And for planets and moons, they're manually defined. So we basically build out the planetarium like this by just setting the orbital parameters for each planet and for each moon. And we let them orbit based on the game clock. And uh, for spacecraft, we have what became known as the rail system, which is basically the same thing for spacecraft. But the thing is here, for spacecraft, we are running physics, but at some points we have to stop using physics and switch to the deterministic um, system, which is something we call going on rails. What happens there is that uh, all rigid bodies go kinematic, then the orbit controller switches to driver mode instead of just uh, tracking, and we calculate position and velocity from the two-body solver instead of physics. And the same thing happens in reverse for going off rails, which uh, we make all rigid bodies non-kinematic again. We get the velocity from the two-body solver, and we basically throw the vessel back into physics. And then the orbit controller go, goes back into being just a tracker and updating its own uh, orbital parameters from the vessel and just watching it happen. And then uh, next up is drawing orbits. So to draw the splines, we needed something to draw a line. So we use a plugin called Vectrosity to, to do um, the spline drawing. And basically we build the, the orbit spline just by using the solver. We sample it along its course. So that gives us a very nice um, way to just get, grab an array of points by sampling the orbit as it goes. And, um, and then we render it out in scale space. Um, so scale space then doubles as or map view. So when you hit M and you zoom out to the map, what happens is we disable the local space camera so you don't see the scenery and you don't see the vessel. And we fade in the orbit splines. And then we disable the scaled camera script, which is basically just a little script that tracks the local camera and applies a scale factor to it. And on the same camera, we enable the map camera script. So that's how we do the map view, just by uh, switching the camera behavior. And this map view was really important because the big thing about KSP is that it needs to be approachable. And the problem, the main problem I see with rocket science is that uh, you have a severe lack of situational awareness. You really don't know what's going on because there wasn't like a real um, easy, intuitive way to see it. So the biggest challenge, I think, in KSP was this, was how to um, convey what's going on in a way that's visual and informative, but without 
just dumping a lot of data on the player. So the map is fully 3D and you're free to move around and you're free to focus on different objects and view your orbit from every angle. So that way you get this much more intuitive understanding of what's going on just because of the way it's drawing in 3D space and you can move the camera around and see it from different angles. So we only show numerical data when it's really needed. So this is why we have things like, um, sorry, too early. <laughs> Um, when you get to, when you hover over the nodes on the map view, then we show what the node is and what its values are. So we're not flooding the players with numbers all the time because otherwise it's very easy to just fill the screen up with numbers and end up with something very uh, unattractive. So um, finally, we patch orbits together to do, um, to do the full trajectory display. Now, I had uh, 30 more slides on this and it could go on endlessly, but uh, it's not gonna be enough time to cover how we do this. But basically, we use the rail system to predict where you're gonna be and where each planet is gonna be by the time you get there. And from that, we figure out what your next orbit is gonna be inside the sphere of influence of that other body. And so on and so forth uh, uh, until we either reach some sort of limit or reach an orbit where you can't, uh, where you don't find any more encounters or escapes. And uh, we display that using um, different time reference frames, is what I call it. You can see that uh, as you encounter the moon, you don't really see your orbit around the moon. You see your orbit around the moon in relation to Kerbin, because the moon is also moving. So we're really essentially trying to show 4D data in a 3D space. And uh, there was a good deal of uh, hat bashing to figure out a way to uh, show this in a way that makes the most sense. And we eventually settled with this, which is that uh, we show your orbit locally for the planet you're orbiting. And uh, if you encounter a planet somewhere ahead, we show that orbit in relative frame, which is what we call that. Uh, each point is sampled. Um, at the spot it's gonna be at that time. So that gives us a nice uh, squiggly line where you can see things like uh, how you encounter the moon, loop around it, and jump back. So um, that's basically how we do it. <laughs> I forgot those were there. And uh, so moving on, this is another interesting part of the, uh, the game that uh, we felt was worth showing. Um, the reentry effects and how we did that. Basically, the problem with reentry effects was that uh, we wanted the ship to look like it was catching on fire and you could see the plasma like licking the, the, uh, the ship as it went. But the big problem with this is that on a more uh, conventional game, you'd have this effect done for the specific ship and have another version of it for another ship and so on. But we don't know what the ship looks like. We can just build anything. So we needed to find a way to do this effect um, that would support any configuration of something you might build. And uh, apart from that, we ran into another problem, which is uh, no one really knows what reentry effects look like. Um, there's a lot of uh, image, images on the internet if you just look for it. But uh, you can see that uh, of all of these, they're all artist rendering. Uh, none of them are actually a picture. No one's ever, uh, you can't find like a really nice picture of what the reentry effect looks like. So in the end, we settled in trying to achieve this look, which we broke down into two components, the heat glow and the flame trail. So for the heat glow, we tried a couple of things. And uh, we tried, we thought about maybe an emissive texture or something like that, but the emissive map was tricky because uh, we don't really know the orientation of the ship, so which way of it is actually facing the incoming uh, airstream. And uh, what eventually worked best was to just use a light, an orange light placed along the velocity stream. So um, that was much easier, actually. <laughs> so. The flame trails were trickier. The first attempt, we tried to use God Race. And uh, look, 
it looked close to what we wanted to achieve, but it doesn't work. Unless your scene is a black backdrop with nothing else on it, this doesn't work at all. So um, we'd get flame trails on the UI, on everything, so, and it generally broke down. So the second attempt was something more, uh, I remembered seeing this effect for fur shaders. And uh, fur shaders work by, have, by uh, drawing the same object again and again using shells and just having a transparent texture. And uh, I thought, well, maybe we can abuse this in some way. So I got a fur shader and started tweaking it and a modified fur shader gave us this result. Basically, we draw um, a multipass shader um, and all of the shells are uh, offset progressively along the, well, the opposite of the velocity vector. So they're running away from you. And we, on, on top of that, on each pass, we run um, slightly different parameters for uh, uh, opacity and color and things like that. So that started to look real nice. And we do that, uh, we render it out in the game by using replace shaders and an effects camera on top of all the other cameras we already had. So um, it's just one more camera at that point. Um, <laughs> so we render the ship as normal and then we run the effects pass which renders it again with a replaced shader. And, uh, but the problem with that is that it worked a little too well. <laughs> so every face would be uh, on fire, even back faces. So that didn't look really right. Um, we'd get the, uh, the burning window effect, as it was named by the community. So the way we solved that was to do essentially shadow mapping. We got a camera uh, along the velocity vector that renders the ship uh, with a depth texture, and uh, we projection map this depth texture onto the ship. And then on the shader, we can check if the, uh, for each vertex, if the depth of the vertex matches the depth on the map. And if it doesn't, we occlude it. And if it does, it means that it's actually exposed to the airstream. So that way we can mask off the areas that are occluded and are not on fire. And that uh, pretty much solved the issue. And then lastly, um, we, use an animated texture map to actually uh, modify the extrusion length of each pass. That required us to use a, a vertex uh, texture read, which thankfully was possible uh, on Shader Model 3. So this screenshot doesn't really uh, convey what actually happens. There's a video later on. And uh, we actually got a nice bonus feature from this. We got, just by tweaking the parameters and the way we scaled the offsets, we got to do Mac effects, which um, basically use the same approach, just uh, with tweaked values. So here we've got a, a little video of uh, the orbiting a space station in the name of science. And I'm not getting it to play. Uh, why is this not playing? Sorry, minor technical difficulties. Oh, it's because we're not connected. We didn't get on the Wi-Fi, did we? Well, we're not anymore. Um, so we might have to skip this part. Sorry, if we can get the connection back later, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. So. Uh, next up is the terrain, and uh, for that part, we, we've got Mike, who is uh, at fault for all that, so. Testing? Hello. Um, so uh, our train system is called uh, the Procedural Quad Sphere, or uh, PQS. Um, Basically, um, it's uh, a method we use for rendering the uh, terrain. So we've got some sample shots. Here's uh, a nice little mountain range and some planes in Kerbin. 
Um, here's another mountain range and some lovely trees scatter. Uh, here's a view from KSC showing um, some more mountains, actually. So the aims of the system. Uh, first of all, we needed a ground-to-orbit level of detail system, uh, pretty important in a space game. Um, we needed planetary scales. Uh, Kerbin is um, 600 kilometers in radius, which is a couple of million square kilometers. Um, we need to have a huge variation on the planets themselves and between the planets. Um, and something that's not ev uh, you know, immediately evident, but it's quite important, is we need to be able to sample the terrain without building the mesh or building colliders so we can ray cast against them. Um, this allows us to do lots of things, uh, radar altitude and collision on objects which we're not in orbit of so for other ships in the solar system. Um, so what is a quad sphere? Um, it's a sphere made of quads. Um, first of all, we start with a distorted cube base, uh, and then we use a quad tree subdivision to uh, get the level of detail increases. Um, so what, what does this look like? Um, here's something which will never happen in the game. It's a minus one sphere. Um, this would never happen because we never store the planet like this. So I've had to mock it up with planes in Unity. Um, each, each plane is 16 by 16 vertices. Um, then we do a few operations on it, and we end up with a level zero sphere. So this is the lowest resolution thing that we can have in the game. Um, as you can see, the six planes are now mapped to the surface of the sphere. Um, here is one of the planes selected. You can see it's a nice curved shape, um, and they all match up edge-wise. So here's level one. Uh, we've uh, got four times the number of vertices here. Um, and you can see that the same uh, plane that we had in the other one um, is subdivided into these four planes. And let's move to level two. So we can see that the upper right quad that we had in that plane has now been subdivided into four, uh, giving us four, um, four times as many vertices. Level three, we're getting quite a lot of vertices now. Level four, it's pretty hardcore. Um, and level five is pretty black. Um, so how many vertices have we got? Um, Kerbin 600 uh, kilometers radius, so uh, the vertex resolution is 75 kilometers in a level zero sphere, uh, 1,500 verts, um, quite handleable. Uh, the level five sphere you see is uh, 2.3 kilometers vertex resolution, uh, but it's 1.5 million verts, which is pretty extreme. Um, now, most spheres run up to level 10 in the game. Uh, which if we rendered it straight out would be 73 meters resolution, which is adequate for the game, uh, but it's 1.6 billion verts, which uh, Unity would not render, surprisingly. Um, so we need to use adaptive subdivision. And to do this, obviously we need to use uh, distance to the camera. Um, we use various types of distance. We've obviously got the linear distance, but we've also got the great circle distance around the sphere. Um, and the algorithm to calculate the subdivision is quite uh, complicated. I'm not going to go into it, but if you ask me later, I will do. Um, quite important is only subdividing ourselves one level higher than our neighbor quads. Um, this is quite important because if you start to have four neighbor quads, it gets quite complicated. And um, we have the next point, which is we need to avoid cracks. Um, so here's a, a level zero to 10 sphere. Uh, you can see that the, um, where the subdivision changes, it's only one subdivision level higher. Um, uh, where the tiny white circle is on the left, that's where the camera's placed, and under that will be subdivision level 10. Um, 
on the opposite side of the sphere would be subdivision level zero. Um, how quickly that changes depends on parameters we enter, um, but is all to do with the radius, great circle distance. It's quite complicated. Um, so the dreaded cracks. Now, if we just do it simply, we end up with nasty cracks, uh, which you can see here. Um, the quad in the lower left is one subdivision level higher than the rest. So its vertices have, its quads have twice as many verts, so we end up with cracks potentially as the uh, vertexes change. So we use a geo mapping technique called, um, well, edge fans, where we lerp the edge triangles so that they skip vertices. Um, so that they match up with the lower subdivision on the other sides. Um, now, there's, doing this um, high performance is quite tricky, but quite simple when you think about it. There are only 17 possible edge conditions for every quad. Uh, the first one being that we are the same subdivision as all our neighbors. Um, so that means we just render a straight quad with all triangles. Um, then we, uh, we've obviously got if the north edge has two neighbors or the south edge has two neighbors or three edges have two neighbors or all four edges have two neighbors, which would be pretty rare, but it's one of the edge conditions. So it's one plus um, four to the power of two or something. Hmm. Um, so what we do is for each one of those edge conditions, we cache a triangle array, um, and then we use a bit, ma bit mask to select the correct one. Uh, this means we don't have to re-triangulate quads um, as we need to. So here we are, we've got possible edge conditions. This is our bit mask. Um, so we assign a value of one, two, four, and eight to the respective edges. Um, and let's have a look at that. So here we've got um, a quad which has its south and east edges need lerping. So using the bitmap, it, we need to lerp east and south, which would be two plus four. Uh, so it would be the sixth index on the uh, triangle array. And as you can see, we've got no cracks now, which is nice. So how do we generate a quad? First things first, uh, we need to generate the vertices. Second thing, we obviously select our triangle array. Um, then we create the mesh data, uh, which is just as simple uh, dumping the things into a Unity mesh. Um, for each vertex, we take our cached XZ quad, uh, and then we transform it with a TRS matrix. This moves the points into a um, into the quad scale, the quad orientation. Um, and then we need to normalize it, which gives us the direction of that vertex from the center of the planet. Um, then we need to generate the height, and we also generate a vertex color uh, in, if we are using vertex channels on the, the, the planet. So here is our uh, impossible quad. This would never exist in the game. Um, we run it through the matrix and normalize it to get our distorted quad, and then push, push it through uh, the generator to get some variation in height and color. Um, now, how we generate the height and color is all down to something we call PQS mods. Um, and PQS mods make planets good. So here, here's um, Duna looking rather resplendent. Uh, so, PQS mods are simple mono behavior components we attach to um, sub-objects of a PQS. Uh, they're compiled at start up into method chains, which means that we can just call the vertex build height method and it will execute all the entire chain. Um, they control all aspects of the planet lifetime um, the obvious one being terrain generation, as we've just said, but uh, there's also the game interface. Uh, the PQS system was developed 
as a, a separate module. So the game controls the PQS through the mods, and the PQS, well, is, is a very dumb system, so the mods control the PQS as a sort of like feedback loop. Um, we've got a few types of uh, PQS mods. We've got a vertex mod, which uh, comes in two flavors, height and color. There are also color height or height color mods. Um, we've got object placement and visibility. So these um, position um, cities and objects on the surface. They also control a uh, level of detail of those uh, objects. Um, we've got level of detail of the PQS itself. So for instance, we might want to increase the level of detail of the coastal quads um, to give a, a, nice, uh, a nicer coast. So we've got mods to do that. And we've also got material and shader mods. These are, there's some quite complicated shader work in a PQS, uh, depending on how the planet's rendered. So that's all done through the mod. Uh, mod. So we've got a few methods in a generic mod on setup. Um, this method gathers requirements that the mod has. So potentially it has a vertex color channel or it requires custom normals or, um, well, a whole host of requirements. And these can change how the PQS generates itself. Um, if it requires uh, longitude and latitude for each uh, coordinate for doing you know, texture mapping or uh, other types of mapping. Um, the on-sphere start is how the PQS controls its startup. So the first time it starts up, it'll run its on-sphere start, and there might be a mod which says, don't start up now. So that sort of turns it on and off. Um, then we've got on vertex build height, which is the classic build height. Um, when we want to generate the terrain height for a position, this mod, uh, well, the on vertex build height uh, methods are run. So it just generates the height. It doesn't generate any color or anything like that. Um, then we've got build color if we're using vertex colors. And um, on quad build is used for um, assigning scatter or a variety of other little tricks that are per quad. Uh, there are about 20 of these methods. So I'm not going into all of them. Um, so, very simple example, uh, here is a blank sphere. Um, we'll add a simplex noise onto it. Uh, simplex is like a Perlin noise, but it's a bit faster at higher octaves, so we tend to use it quite a bit. Um, then we use a clamp height mod, so it makes a nice little ocean type moon. Um, enhance ridges to kind of remove some of the fractally the cloudiness of a simplex or a purlin. They can be quite cloudy and repetitive despite being fractals. And then run a bit of height-based color on top as well. So we've got a nice little landscape there. So uh, quick talk on shader techniques. Uh, we obviously use vertex color blending. Um, there's a variety of ways to do this. We've tried lots. Um, yeah, you can spend a long time blending vertex colors. Uh, we use a, a triplanar texture mapping technique to texture the actual planet. Uh, triplanar is good because uh, if you have ever, ever tried to texture map a sphere, you, you struggle because the UV coordinates have to have a seam. And uh, generating that on a PQS at runtime is quite uh, tricky. We also have normal mapping to make our ruggedness a bit more rugged. and uh, there's two other techniques. We use distance-based um, multi-texturing. So uh, we have a detailed texture up close and further away, we, it comes fuzzier to avoid scaling and slope-based multi-texturing. So uh, the higher the slope, the more um, rocky it might get, or uh, if it was flatter, it might have a bit more sand on it or something. Um, here's a look at what a triplane texture map looks like. Um, it's textured over three planes, hence the name. Uh, you've got an X, Y, and Z texture. And um, with some additional mesh uh, information, you can generate uh, a UV coordinate from the X, Y, Z coordinate and use um, the triplanar technique. 
And as you can see, without the grid and with a, a normal texture, it looks, it looks quite nice. Um, we can also do some other things. We can render a PQS out. Um, we can render it to texture maps. Um, and we can also use grayscale height maps, which uh, we can then re-import using the grayscale to normal, uh, normal map. And we can use data maps as well, because um, some PQSs are not generated as planets, but we use them as basis for other types of maps. Um, the, the sun texture is generated uh, using a shader with three data maps from a PQS. Uh, it's very good for generating spherical data sets. And we can also generate a mesh. Um, and generally what we do is we wrap um, a geosphere mesh around a PQS uh, to generate the planet meshes for scaled space. Um, so here's, here's Kerbin in scaled space. Uh, this has been rendered out to um, a normal map and a texture map. So these are just from the vertex colors and from the vertex heights. Um, we tend to not use a mesh on planets with oceans. So the blue color is actually defined uh, by the renderer. Um, and this is because the coasts, if you have a mesh, look a bit odd. Uh, without doing some level of detail on the mesh wrapper itself. Um, some smaller moons. Here's Paul using um, both, well, all three normal texture and uh, a mesh wrapper. So you can see it's got lots of height. Um, so when we blend between scaled space and local space, it um, blends nicely. Um, we've got Vol as well, which is uh, an icy moon of Joule and BOP, which is a bit boring, but it's quite lumpy. So it's a good example. Um, now, just a quick talk on modding KSP, where wonders never cease. We're often astounded by the things people can come up with. Um, so the early setup of KSP, um, there were part code modules. Um, and these were things like a command pod, a winglet, engine, fuel tank, uh, control surfaces, um, struts, all these sort of things were a single code module. Um, it had a text-based config system, which was uh, pretty basic. Um, a DAE model loader, uh, which was, again, pretty basic. Um, and we could load PNG and JPEG textures. Um, Obviously, when you give the promise of being able to mod things to people, um, they kind of go above and beyond what we expect. Um, so we had a user which took the KSP DLL, uh, he decompiled it. He then injected DLL loading code. Um, he recompiled it. And at this point, we're all thinking, uh, this could be terrible. But what he did was actually send the results to us first to say, you know, can I distribute this thing? Uh, we said no, um, but we hired him anyway. <laughs> so um, Rob now works for us. I think he's on the web team. But uh, suffice to say, the fruits of his labors have still, are still in KSP. So having all this DLL loading things made us uh, no, we needed to change the way that parts worked. So we made a move towards part modules. Basically, parts have multiple part modules. Uh, this means that uh, the part code goes from defining all of the logic to just defining the attachment logic. So um, there are pretty much only two types of part now. Uh, there's a standard part, which is uh, it can attach to other parts. And there's a strut which has a start and an end point and then would define itself as those attachments. Um, the part module then dis defines the functional logic. So we've got the command modules, the engines, the fuel tanks, the wings, all of those uh, goodness goes into part modules. This gives us a lot more flexibility and allows us to have a single part, which is a lifting body, an engine, a command pod, all rolled into one, which would have been obviously impossible in the old system. Um, and then we've, we've got internal space definitions. Um, internal spaces were added quite late, only a couple of updates ago. Um, 
parts can have a single internal space definition. Um, an internal space has a single mesh object which it can load in. Um, but to give it variation and to obviously have control, uh, we have things called internal props. Uh, an internal space can have uh, multiple internal props. Um, and then internal props then have a single mesh object. But to give them variation, they have multiple internal modules. So they become parts in a way. And then our part uh, internal modules are sort of like part modules. So you could have a, a nav ball, which is a fuel display as well, and all these things. But everything from a seat to an internal camera um, are all defined in internal modules uh, through the config system. Um, so our config system got upgraded to something we call config node. Um, its, its main uh, aim was to be backward compatible with all the old configs, so we couldn't switch to using a, a proprietary or a, you know, a standard JSON type system. Um, basically, it's a standardized text-based config system, which consists of a hierarchy of nodes uh, and values. Uh, and it's compiled and passed situationally, um, meaning that whoever's compiling the, uh, whoever's loading and compiling the um, config can do so in any way they like. So we'd, we're not restricted on what's actually inside these config nodes. Um, here's a sample one from the Coppola part. Um, you can see it's got a name, which is its um, unique, unique ID. Uh, it is a part, which is a standard part. It's got a category, mass, a drag, drag model type. Um, it's then got two module nodes. One of them is a command module, uh, which says it requires one minimum crew to operate properly. Um, it's got a SAS module. Um, and then it's got an internal space definition, which uh, is the, in, the cupola internal, which it would load via that name. Um, then we've got uh, mu files. Hmm. Um, mu files are a custom model file format that we use. Um, inside, they contain a full Unity hierarchy with a whole host of things which uh, you can output from the Unity editor. Um, and they're set up and compiled by a Unity editor plugin, um, which is, well, this is the current setup. <laughs> uh, so we've got the part, part modules, internal space, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we use the config node system. We have a DLL loader uh, to let stop people uh, writing their own. We use DAE and MU. Um, we've got a whole host of texture formats. Um, so the part tools is what we use to generate user content. Uh, it's a Unity editor plugin. Uh, it allows people to compile assets. Uh, you can create MU files. You can convert um, and can create textures. Uh, you can load, save, and create internal space configs. So this is the position of the um, props and uh, the modules and things that are on them. Um, here's a little screenshot of part tools running uh, an internals um, thing. As you can see, you can spawn various components and snap them and all that goodness. Uh, right, I think we're quickly running out of time. I'm going to hand over to uh, Felipe quickly for the final stint. Okay. Oh, it's live again. So. Running short for time, so we're going to keep this um, quick as much as possible. So, well, we, KSP is still being developed, so we can't really say we've learned from it and that's it. We're still learning, we're still going. And uh, But if there's one thing that I guess uh, made all the difference with KSP was that uh, Kerbals make it more than just a game about building spaceships. So they're that uh, humanizing element. They're what makes players relate to the game because now you have something you to care about or to gleefully kill as needed. So, um, so but inter interestingly enough, we had no idea what Kerbals would look like when we started. So 
when we started, we knew we wanted them to have like big heads and bulging eyes, but we didn't really know what they were going to be. So the design kind of evolved into this, and then they grew hair. So this is a Kerbal already rigged up for a, appearing on a Kerbal portrait. And uh, we just made sure that uh, their head meshes bent far enough that they could express their delight or panic. But really, and then we realized we have this whole universe of Kerbals that were just beginning to develop. So there's a lot to take uh, from this. Um, we don't really have a lot of time, but uh, so I'm going to skip this bit. Um, so, and that bit. <laughs> and that bit. <laughs> but uh, going on community feedback, I think this was one of the biggest things for us. When we started developing KSP, we had a lot of uh, open questions. And because we released very early, um, we were able to get community feedback at a point where it was actually very useful to us. So for instance, we didn't even know whether or not we were going to leave the orbital mechanics in the game or not because we thought it might have been too complex. So when we released, not only we discovered that uh, people liked it, they wanted more. So, um, so we kind of shaped the way development went just because, uh, just from, based on community feedback. Uh, the one thing to take from that is that uh, they can be very honest. So you need to be ready for that because it's not all praise. And, uh, Eventually, we get to a point which I call the feedback threshold, which is uh, the point where uh, player feedback can start to become misleading because players, the, the elite players that have been playing the game for uh, over a year now want things that are different from what the new players need. So you kind of have to balance. So that's something that um, we're still, it's an ongoing thing. So we're always trying to balance on each update the features we add and stuff like that to so make sure that uh, it's entertaining for just uh, for it's something that it's good for new players and it also is something of value for players that have been uh, added from the beginning. So that's it. I guess uh, there is not a lot of time for questions. but All right. Thank you so very much. There will be coffee in ballroom C if you want to join us and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much.